Thanks, Biff. That was, that was awesome, man. Hey, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm glad you've uh, tuned in tonight, or if you happen to be watching uh, after tonight online on video, we're really glad that uh, you're joining us in this study of Revelation Explained. We're in session 14, actually, and uh, two weeks ago, we entered into the second part of the book, which from the perspective that I'm teaching it, which is called a futurist perspective, uh, we really entered into things that are yet to come uh, in the days ahead of us. I thought real briefly I'd give you uh, just a, a, a quick overview of a couple of things, but before I do, I uh, wanted to remind you that uh, I have written a book on this subject. You can get it on Amazon. It, it kind of would serve for you as a little bit of a summary because I'm going much deeper than the book does. But again, uh, just put my name into the search engine and you can find this. Uh, it's available there. And also, uh, if you aren't on our email list, if you aren't getting every week an email from me uh, telling you what is getting ready to come up uh, on Wednesday night, uh, just shoot me an email and let me know you want to get on that list. Now, let's go back for just a second and remember what we've looked at in the last couple of weeks. John, of course, on the island of Patmos, political prisoner of the Roman Empire, and there in a very difficult situation, he has an amazing experience. First of all, where Christ appears to him and uh, tells him to write what he's about to see, which he does, which ends up being the book of Revelation. But then when we hit chapter 4, he has an experience, an ecstatic spiritual experience where we're told that he is, he's caught up into heaven and actually sees the dwelling place, the manifestation of the dwelling place of God. And, and there he sees a throne. As a matter of fact, you might say he sees the throne, the, the controlling point of the entire seen and unseen universe, and there's someone sitting on it. It's occupied. Uh, God is still on the throne. Uh, everything is on schedule, in a sense, uh, would be the message that perhaps that would immediately hit John. But he also notices that in the right hand of the one that's sitting on the throne is a scroll. And it's a critically important scroll because this scroll contains the future of humanity and the universe. And, uh, and then a question uh, gets asked. And the question that gets asked is, who's worthy to, uh, to uh, break the seals and open the scroll? And the idea of who is worthy, on the outside of that scroll, there's writing along with seven seals, and the writing uh, would give us the requirements uh, for who is it that meets those requirements that could open this scroll. And at first, no one in, on heaven and uh, on earth or under the earth is found. And if, if you want to know the reason for that, you need to go back to uh, last week and watch that video where we go into a great deal of explanation. But when no one can be found, we're told that John breaks down and uh, he, he begins to weep hysterically uh, for one big reason. If this scroll is not opened, which contains the future, God's future for humanity, if this scroll is not opened, nothing changes and evil wins. And then we're told that one of the 24 elders uh, comes to John and tells him to stop crying because actually there is one who is worthy, who meets what are virtually impossible requirements, if you remember, and uh, he says, the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed, just as Biff sang in the song this evening. And John then sees a lamb. This is really the second big vision of Jesus. There are four symbolic visions of Jesus in the book of Revelation. In chapter 1, we see him as the Son of Man, risen and glorified. Now, John sees a lamb. It's a lamb that was put to death and yet lives, that has seven horns and seven eyes. And what we saw last week is, again, that, that this represents Jesus in his perfect power and his perfect knowledge. And again, a point I want to make is simply this, that, that on the cross, we know that Christ died for our sins. 
But there was something much bigger than that going on at the cross because it was there at the cross as the God-man uh, sacrificed his own life for humanity that he met the requirements that would enable him to open this scroll so that God's future plans can unfold. So the worthiness of the Lamb to open the scroll and what we're going to see in the rest of the book goes back to the cross. And then we're told that the Lamb takes the scroll and uh, praise and worship break out in heaven for the worthiness of the Lamb to open it. And that brings us right up then to chapter 6, that we're going to uh, look at part of tonight and the rest of next week. So let me just begin by reading the very beginning here of chapter 6. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, and then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. And he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Seal number one gets opened, and what we see is the rider on the white horse. Each of these first four seals will be introduced to us by one of the living creatures, the seraphim, um, uh, saying in front of John, and the question is, is he saying to John, come so that you can see, or is he saying come as a command that then brings forth uh, one of these riders on the horses? I tend to lean in, in, in that direction. And what we're going to look at in, in these first four uh, few verses here, excuse me, are what are called the, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, some of you watching are pretty young, uh, some of you are a bit older like myself, and you know there was a time, and this is a little bit of a, an aside, but there was a time where if you spoke to someone uh, that wasn't quite familiar with the Bible and you asked them who are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they would tell you that, well, that's, that is uh, the, the backfield uh, of the University of Notre Dame. And uh, back in 1924, Notre Dame had an amazing football uh, team. They went 10-0, and won the Rose Bowl, and they had these four backs in the backfield that were so amazing that a sports writer, probably the, the most well-known sports writer uh, of the day named Grantland Rice, he, he wrote an article in October of 1924 uh, that has been called the most famous football lead-in of all time. And in that article, this is what he said. Outlined against the blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again. They're dramatic in dramatic lore, their names are death, destruction, pestilence, and famine. But those are aliases. Their real names are Stuttlehair, Crowley, Miller, and Layden, and that was the name of these four uh, backs. Their coach, by the way, uh, probably a familiar name at least, Newt uh, Rockney, uh, and, uh, and they became known as the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, um, but they weren't the real ones. Actually, the real ones are the ones that are contained here in the book of Revelation, so let's get back to the Bible for a second. A rider comes forth, and we've seen that he's a rider on the white horse, and we're told about him that he is a conqueror, and he is bent on conquest, that he has a crown upon his head, that he carries a bow. The question is, who or what is this? And again, as I've said before, when we get into this section of the book of Revelation, uh, it gets pretty wild. And, and even in the early church, there was a lot of uh, debate about what some of these symbols meant, and, and uh, there was a lot of discussion 
I've read multitudes of common commentaries and hardly any one of them agrees on most of what we're getting ready to see, so we're going to be making some educated uh, guesses about it. Uh, but uh, there are two kind of primary theories about uh, who this rider on the white horse is. Uh, the one theory, uh, because he's a conqueror and he's coming forth in conquest, one theory is that, well, actually, uh, this represents Jesus Christ. And uh, the fact that he is a conqueror coming forth uh, on conquest, again, is related to the fact that as this scroll uh, is opened, that, that Christ is going to do battle against the evil in the world, and he's going to win. And so, uh, you know, again, there are some that uh, have uh, suggested that. And, and also, he's dressed in white, he's on a white horse, he, and he wears, wears a crown, and uh, that then this would mark the beginning of the tribulation uh, period and Christ launching it. Probably not. Uh, the second theory is that rather than Jesus Christ, that this writer actually represents Antichrist and the beginning of the tribulation period. There are uh, two different words, and I think I went into this a little bit back in the letters to the churches, but there are two different words for crown. Uh, our English word translates two different words. This writer wears a Stephanos. When it says crown, that's the word that appears in the Greek. This was the little wreath that oftentimes was given to an athlete when he won at the games, uh, sometimes to, again, a military leader when he won a battle. Uh, sometimes it was uh, made of gold rather than simply of leaves. And uh, here this writer wears the Stephanus. Later on, when we get to chapter 19, where we see the actual coming of Christ, he will wear a diadema. We get our word diadem from it. And there's that great old hymn. Uh, it was actually written in 1780 uh, called All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And again, unfortunately, there's at least a whole generation uh, even of those that go to church that maybe have never heard this great hymn. But in that hymn, there is a chorus that says, Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. So even though both of these figures are wearing crowns, they're two very different crowns. And uh, Christ uh, will, be, we will be wielding a sword this writer has a bow. And so uh, even though he looks like this could be Jesus, that actually ties into Scripture too because when Antichrist comes, many people are going to be deceived and they're going to view the Antichrist as if he's the savior of the world. He, he's going to solve problems. You know, maybe he'll solve climate change. Uh, maybe he will solve a war when we're going to look at potential war that goes on. But he'll be viewed as a hero at first. And uh, the book of Daniel, which we're going to get into a little later on, also says that during uh, this seven-year period we call the tribulation, perhaps for as much as three and a half years of that, uh, he's viewed as a good guy. And then something happens there at that midpoint where we realize this is not a good guy. This is actually the Antichrist. And uh, along with that, why we might think that this represents Antichrist is because in that prophecy of Daniel, about the 70th week of Daniel, the final seven years of history, which again is what Revelation chapter 6 through 19, uh, a futurist believes, deals with, the thing that triggers that, that seven-year period is that, that Antichrist enters into some kind of a treaty with the nation of Israel. I'm not suggesting, by the way, here that uh, our president is the, uh, the Antichrist, and I'm not even suggesting this is the treaty, but, but things like this are going on right now. I mean, it is very rare, but just recently, 
uh, you know, we brokered a deal between Israel and two nations in the Middle East for peace. Uh, we're told more nations are going to enter into that. But there will come a point in time where there will be a treaty. My hunch is that it's going to have to do, have something to do with Palestinian territory so that, uh, that, that control of the city of Jerusalem uh, again, is in the hands of Israel, and perhaps even something to do with permission to rebuild the temple, because when we get a little further on in the book of Revelation, we're going to see how that plays in. But, uh, but this writer, I believe then, uh, represents the beginning of that tribulation period. Now, um, this, of course, the book of Revelation, has to do with symbols and signs and visions, and sometimes it's really hard to know what it's talking about. But there are other parts of the Bible that are not uh, apocalyptic, they're not visionary, they're much more didactic and to the point that have a lot to say about this person. And I thought I might just show you a couple of these. So in 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes this, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So there's a, there's a rumor spreading around. There's some, some teaching that's been going on that, that isn't quite accurate about the day of the Lord or the second coming of Christ. And Paul is correcting that, and he is going to show us that there are some things that have to happen first. So he goes on, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion or the apostasy occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. This is another one of the titles of Antichrist. He's called the man of lawlessness here. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that's called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. So a, a couple of things have to happen. One more, let me go on here too. And now you know, we wish we knew, they knew, now you know what's holding him back, what's restraining him is the word that's often used there, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back or restrains it will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. So apostasy is going to occur. The Antichrist is going to be revealed and the restrainer will be removed. This is another one of those uh, statements, uh, even though it's not in, a, in Revelation, where the question is, who or what is the restrainer? Uh, Paul's audience seems to have known, but, uh, but we don't, and again, a lot of debate about it. Those that happen to have, uh, and again, you'd have to go back to session 10 to understand this, a, uh, what's called a pre-trib uh, view, a futurist pre-trib view, that believe that, uh, that the church is literally going to be taken out of the world before the beginning of the tribulation and that the church will not be present during that time, uh, they believe that the restrainer is the church and that somehow the presence of the church in the world uh, restrains evil, but that's going to be removed when the church is removed at the rapture. Uh, others believe it, it's the Holy Spirit but they usually will also say it's the Holy Spirit in the church. So again, when the church is removed and the presence of the Holy Spirit, who now dwells in believers, is, uh, is taken out of the way, that then uh, lawlessness, the restraint, uh, 
that has been restraining evil will be let loose and evil will flourish. Um, you know, it's interesting to me when I read this passage, by the way, because part of what it tells me is this. We know we live in a fallen world, and we know that horrible things happen in a fallen world. We look at it all around us in these days. We see, you know, disease. We see uh, uh, right now in our history uh, fires that are destroying entire towns and people losing everything, some people losing their life. We see anarchy uh, in the streets of our cities at times. And, and, and we look at it and we think, how could it be any worse? worse? And yet the scripture said it's actually being restrained. But a day will come when that restrainer is removed. And when that happens, uh, things are really uh, going to get very difficult. As Paul said, there will be terrible times in, in the last days. And so uh, the question is, does that happen when Jesus breaks the first seal and Antichrist is set loose by that first horseman? Uh, let's use that as a takeaway uh, and um, maybe with a little bit of a question, Mark, but let's just say that that, uh, that, that is what happens with the first, when the first seal is broken and that it tells us that the tribulation is coming. Uh, the restrainer has been removed. By the way, and again, if, if this is something you're not familiar with, it's because you probably weren't with us in session 10, but one of the views, and there are pastors in the Denver area that even hold this, one view is that Revelation, uh, everything in it was uh, accomplished in the first century, and that the message of Revelation was really uh, about the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, punishment from God for the rejection of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ. And there's a history behind that, but those that hold that view uh, believe that who this writer is is either Vespasian or his son Titus, uh, because the siege on Jerusalem that began in 66 AD, uh, first the Roman army, it, it, it uh, came and uh, surrounded Jerusalem, and at first Vespasian uh, led that army, but he was called back to Rome to become emperor, and his son Titus then took over and eventually defeated. But those that hold that first century kind of a view, they would identify uh, this as actually being representative of, of the Roman general and that this is the beginning of the siege on, on Jerusalem. We're not taking that approach, obviously. We're taking a more futuristic approach. Uh, so that's the first seal gets broken. The second seal, when the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. And to him was given a large sword. So the second rider and the second horse of the horsemen of the apocalypse is the rider on the red horse. And we're told that he, he wields a large sword and that he, that he will remove peace from the earth and that the consequence will be that, that people will, will kill each other and that there will be uh, a lot of people that will kill each other. Traditionally, uh, this writer has oftentimes been uh, identified as uh, war. That, uh, that war will now break out, and war really does play uh, quite a role in the book of Revelation. But I've got to say that even in the way that it's phrased, uh, that, that it could be perhaps just violence that uh, suddenly is let loose, just like what we're seeing, the anarchy in the streets, and that somehow that, uh, that the removal of peace and uh, people uh, given uh, sort of a freedom to, be, to kill each other, uh, it, it, that, that would be one possibility. Again, war sort of tends to be the uh, primary um, interpretation of this. Uh, many that are futurists 
uh, we'll point back to uh, a passage that we looked at uh, back in session number 11 when I kind of went through the world scenario today. And there, there comes a time at the end of the age where there is going to be an army from the north that will invade Israel. And some people believe that, uh, that that's what's happening here, that prior to the larger war that, that, in a sense, ultimately leads to Armageddon, that perhaps this is that passage in Ezekiel uh, where we're told that the kings of the north uh, invade Israel. Ezekiel says it this way, After many days, uh, you, and he's talking to this army and this ruler to the north now, you uh, will be called to arms. In future years, you will invade a land that's recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They had been brought out from the nations, and now all of them live in safety." And again, uh, for many years, people believed that perhaps uh, this was Russia, uh, and then Russia sort of uh, lost its, uh, its power uh, when the Soviet Union broke up, and uh, the result of that uh, was that, uh, you know, suddenly people began to think, well, maybe it's not Russia, and yet now we live in a time where Russia is much more aggressive. So it, it could be. But what we're told in Ezekiel, by the way, is that those, uh, those troops uh, are going to be uh, annihilated. And, uh, uh, and eventually, as war uh, grows, it will lead ultimately to uh, Armageddon. All was wars, of course. All of wars. And you can see here where Ezekiel says, you and your troops and the many nations with you and again, we talked about how some of the southern Arab nations ally with that northern power. Uh, advancing like a storm will be like a cloud covering the land. But the scriptures say they're going to get annihilated and, and that something's going to happen. It seems uh, in the text like it's a more supernatural event, perhaps. We don't know. Uh, but that war will end with the northern kingdom being uh, annihilated. And uh, something unique about this. Eventually, we also have a massive army coming from beyond the Euphrates. And, uh, but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves at this point. But war is a big theme. When the third seal is opened, we read this. Well, it will make that a takeaway, by the way. Let's go back to that for one second. Takeaway, Armageddon is coming. So we'll, again, kind of looking ahead. If this is war, ultimately that's where it's leading, Arm Armageddon going, coming. Okay, so uh, let's go on here. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Next slide. Okay, now, the third horse is the black horse. And the black horse uh, is holding this pair of scales, and it has to do with the fact that when there was scarcity or economic collapse or famine, uh, one of the phrases that was used is that during famine that, that bread, uh, eating bread was done by measure. And uh, this is kind of what happens. One of the, one of the seraphim uh, declare that, uh, that, that when this happens, and I think maybe it's on the next slide, let me, let me see. Uh, yeah, then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. Quite possibly it's war itself, uh, if that's what the second writer represents, uh, that creates economic scarcity or uh, economic collapse. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about those uh, kind of what's being said in that text. 
it, we're told that it would be a denarius for a working man's wages. And uh, a, a working man's wages, excuse me, a denarius was a, a working man's wages for a day, and that that would buy a quart of wheat. And a quart of wheat would feed a person for a day. And so uh, normally, under normal times, uh, a normal a working man's salary was about eight quarts uh, of uh, wheat a day. Uh, but now it's been cut back. And then if he had a family uh, and you couldn't afford wheat, you used barley and a denarius would buy three quarts of barley. So uh, again, you could barely feed your family during this period uh, of time. Hyperinflation, in, in a sense, uh, famine for sure, 800% inflation. A and then exceptions, there are exceptions there because remember it says don't damage the oil and the wine. Uh, I've always been taught, and as a matter of fact, this is in my book, and now I'm not sure, so this might be one of my other mistakes in my book, but uh, I was always taught that oil and wine represented luxuries, and so the way that this was interpreted was that the average family would have extreme economic hardship, while the economic elite would not be affected as much because the oil and the wine uh, would not be damaged. But oil and wine were really, really staples. They, they really were part almost of everyone's meal. And, uh, and so what others believe this is saying is that even though there'll be an economic collapse like this, that God is limiting the destruction, uh, that uh, he's limiting the destruction and saying don't damage uh, the olive or the wine, and really what that's talking about are the olive trees and the vineyards. And uh, some believe the reason for that is that it takes an olive tree 15 years to yield a crop that you could get olive oil from. And of course, it took a vineyard several years in order for it to reach a point where uh, wine w was able to be produced. And so it it's as if God, it it he's holding back a little bit here. Don't, don't uh, destroy the oil or the wine. And um, again, a little bit of a, uh, of a spoiler a little bit later on, what we're going to see when we look at the actual larger passages about Antichrist down line is that Antichrist is going to control at least the Western world's economy. And so economic collapse could be engineered uh, when we get to that point in time. But the takeaway, I think, uh, from this writer is simply this, that uh, economic collapse is coming. Difficult economic times or coming. Let me make another little comment, by the way, about those that hold to that, uh, what's called the Praetorist view, which was, again, first century, uh, the belief that everything was accomplished in the first century. But the destruction of Jerusalem really kind of fits this scenario. Because what happened is, is that when the Roman army laid siege, and it was a three-year siege, no food could get in to Jerusalem, and nothing could get out of Jerusalem. And the Roman historian Josephus said that that created both intense famine inside the city while, before the army even had attacked, and violence, because people got, became violent. There were groups of people that were warring internally against each other uh, just for a day's food. And uh, a large sword was given to Vespasian and uh, Titus, and there was disease and there was pestilence. Josephus said mothers were even eating their babies. I mean, it was horrible. So there's a way that this fits in uh, to that kind of a scenario. I, I believe that the further we get along, I believe the less of Revelation fits in. But just so you know that, uh, that those that hold to that view believe that's what's happening here, that it's about now the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman army. Then we come to the fourth seal. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, 
Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. The rider on the pale horse, this artist has has made him a a skeletal figure on that that fourth horse there. But pale here, uh, the idea of pale is uh, ashen, uh, almost deathly looking, the horse. It was a word that talked sort of about a, a sickly grayish green. And the rider on the horse is named Death. So, so death is personified here uh, in the text, and in the same way uh, that death is personified, uh, Hades is following close behind, and again, Hades gets personified in the text. And what do they do? Well, this text tells us what they did. They, and by the way, it's either death and Hades that the they is referring to, It could be referring to all of the horsemen at this point in time. Remember, the scroll isn't even opened yet. Just the seals are being broken, and we're going to see how once the scroll is opened, we come back to some of these same kind of scenarios. But this is what we're told. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. This uh, image of these four uh, powers uh, really are are, uh, taken all the way back from the book of Ezekiel uh, when God talks about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem back in 586 that was coming. And uh, Ezekiel writes this, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, How much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beasts and plague to kill its men and its animals? And we're told now uh, in the text in Revelation that uh, that they're given uh, permission. Let's go back one, uh, one slide. They're given permission to kill a quarter of the earth's population. Now, uh, if that was talking about first century, as again, those that hold to that particular view, uh, we believe that at the end of the first century, the population of the world, this is, this is a little bit uh, mind boggling for us to think about, the population of the world was only 200 million people at the end of the first century, but if they're given power to, uh, to put to death a quarter of the world's population, we're talking about 50 million people that die from these uh, four uh, um, uh, judgments that get unleashed. And uh, if we're talking about now, and it's again, it's futuristic, uh, the population of the planet now is approaching 8 billion people. It, it means that, that 2 billion people Uh, would die from what is coming as these seals are unleashed and as the scroll is open, because again, it all is going to tie together. It's not necessarily chronological here. Uh, It kind of all happens together and there's overlaps and some of the future judgments also might be involved. But plague plays a big part. Uh, Plague or pestilence. Our word that we use now is pandemic. One of the questions, by the way, uh, that was asked of me by uh, Jerry Dixon actually sent in this question. He had had heard someone speaking about a sermon, and uh, it was the the person that was giving the sermon, it was their conviction that COVID was uh, a judgment by God, and uh, that that's why it had come, and that's why so many people were dying. And then... The other idea that the same person had was that if it wasn't a judgment against the world, that it was uh, a refining fire for the church to get serious uh, and repent and uh, seek revival, uh, and that that God had brought COVID uh, for that reason. Um, You know, we're, uh, we're told now that there are worldwide 
uh, about 30 million uh, cases of the virus um, worldwide, not quite yet, but really coming up on a million deaths, uh, 5 million cases in the U.S. alone, and just today they announced that we had passed the 200,000 uh, mark in deaths in, in the U.S. But it, it got me thinking uh, about this idea, is this God's judgment? And uh, over uh, the summer, while we were on break, um, you know, I, I actually read a book on the, the biggest uh, plagues uh, that the planet had ever uh, experienced. And, you know, two of them really struck me uh, as uh, comparing them to what's happening with what we're seeing now. Uh, one was the Black Death. Uh, and we're told that, and that was the uh, bubonic plague. And we're told that uh, somewhere between 75 to 200 million people died from that, and that 60% of Europe was completely wiped out by the plague. And, and so again, you'd have to ask the question, well, was that, was that God's judgment, or was that simply a consequence of, of life in a fallen world, and, and uh, that these things, you know, these things are going to happen? Certainly, God can use things like this, uh, both uh, to get people's attention, perhaps, that uh, are, aren't very interested in spiritual things. And certainly, I think those of us that are believers to, uh, you know, to, to use it to, as a reflection to say, if, if this was something that was being sent, uh, what is it that God's trying to accomplish? Is he, is he trying to help me deal with things in my life? Um, another one uh, that, that really struck me was the Spanish flu. Uh, of 1918, and I think I might have a slide on this one, I'm not sure. Uh, no, okay, let me go back and just uh, hold, that, hold that slide for one second, okay? Uh, I have a slide about Spanish flu, but I've got one point first. Um, the Spanish flu, which was from 1918 to, uh, to 1920, and uh, we're told somewhere between 50 to 100 million people died from the Spanish flu. At that point, there were 1.5 billion people on the earth, and part of where the flu struck was that the last nine months of World War I overlapped with the Spanish flu, and there were soldiers in trenches that got the Spanish flu, and it was, it was, it was horrible. And uh, so again, you have to sort of ask the question, was, what, was God judging? Uh, it certainly was larger than what we're experiencing. Uh, what, was there purpose there? Or what, could God simply use those kind of things? So what we do know is that plague or pandemic will be part of the tribulation. And it's interesting because even non-believing scientists tell us or warn us that, that uh, there are coming you know, super bugs, viruses that will resist any kind of uh, treatment that we could come up with, and that would kind of fit into this picture. One question is, is there any discrimination here uh, in this quarter of the Earth's population? And I think it's significant that it's not just death on the horse, but death is being followed by Hades. And uh, in sort of Hebrew cosmology, Hades was like um, the underground, it was the place of the dead, but Hades was really divided. And uh, Jesus told that great parable about the rich man and Lazarus, and, and in Sheol, the netherworld, there was Hades, which was the place where the unrighteous dead were kept till final judgment, and there was Abraham's bosom, where the righteous were comforted as they waited for the resurrection. And, of course, in the parable, the rich man is in Hades and he's in torment, and the poor beggar is in Abraham's bosom. And so there, was, there might be some discrimination here. Might not be everyone. Perhaps God protects believers in the midst of this. And this actually has some background to it in the book of Ezekiel, because, again, when God gets ready to uh, exercise judgment on Jerusalem, uh, he makes a provision for the righteous. And you kind of see the text here uh, in, in Ezekiel chapter 9, where Ezekiel writes, Then the Lord 
called to the man clothed in linen. This is probably an, an angelic uh, being here. Uh, and had, uh, he had the writing kit at his side and said to him, go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. And then he goes on to say this, slaughter the old men, the young women, uh, men, the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. And so again, there, there, is, a, um, there is some discernment, there's some discrimination where God is going to protect the righteous. And I think as we move through the book of Revelation, I think what we see is that believers, if we're present during this time, uh, that we will not be um, uh, kept from persecution. As a matter of fact, next week we're going to see that. Uh, we won't be kept from persecution. We won't be kept from the, uh, uh, the Antichrist and his schemes against believers. But perhaps we will be protected uh, from the wrath of God. And uh, we're really going to see that uh, when we get into the, the final part of uh, chapter 6 next week, that a, a question gets asked when all of this cosmic chaos that goes on that we'll see next week, who can stand? And then immediately there's like a parenthesis in the book of Revelation, and there's an answer to that question, but we're, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. We'll see more of this next week, and really that brings us to where we will begin next week with the opening of the fifth seal. And our final takeaway then, war, famine, plague are coming. Biff, I think we have a few questions. Why don't you come on up and uh, share those with us? Bob, thank you again so much for all the hard work and research and um, just uh, all that you do in putting these, this uh, class together for us. Uh, what an amazing treatise on the book of Revelation and a lot of thoughtful things that we need to be thinking about. So the first question uh, is, do you think COVID is God's judgment? You kind of talked a little bit about that uh, t tonight. And, um, and so that really, I, I think you should think about that in, in, in your group discussion. Do you think that COVID is God's judgment? Our second question tonight is, do you think the Antichrist is in the world today? You alluded to that in some of the speculation of the world. Um, when I was a kid, people thought Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist because his name had six letters in each name, Ronald Wilson Reagan. And uh, it's amazing how you can make any, you can you can almost make a straw man out of uh, out of any of these. So the second question is, do you think the Antichrist is in the world today? And our third question is this: What would you do if the world economy collapsed? What would you do if the world's economy collapsed? We want to thank you all for joining us this evening.